Uh, so I'd like to welcome onto the stage uh, Tess and Monsi. <clears throat> Monsi is our, our moderator today. She's an ex-director of the MIT Bitcoin Expo. Currently, she is the VP at Skynet Labs, where she focuses on building key infrastructure for a decentralized web. Monsi is also the founder of Women in Blockchain, whose mission is to increase diversity in the crypto industry. She most recently launched an investment DAO, Komarebi Collective, focused on funding female and non-binary founders. And our speaker today, Tess Reinierson, leads the crypto team at Twitter. She came to Twitter from the Interchange Foundation, where as VP of Engineering, she led teams building open source software infrastructure for many leading blockchain networks, including Cosmos. Among other things, these teams were responsible for Tendermint Core, a, proof of, a popular proof of stake consensus engine, and the inter-blockchain inter communication protocol, a leading interoperability standard. Tess studied computer science at, at UPenn and Carnegie Mellon University before leaving to join the early engineering team at Medium. A frequent panelist and presenter at both developer and blockchain conferences, Tess serves on the board of the MENA Foundation, which is building the world's lightest blockchain protocol. She remains on the governing council of the Interchain Foundation. Thank you. Bob. You really got my whole life story in there, huh? <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you. <laughs> you missed that you both went to high school together, correct? <laughs> yeah, and we haven't seen each other since then, so it's an incredibly small world, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I love that the last conversation ended with, connect with me on Twitter. Isn't yeah. that all of crypto? That's, uh, that's certainly what we like to see. <laughs> <laughs> love that. Nice segue into this fireside chat. Just welcome. Super excited for this conversation today. Um, always great to come back to Boston, come back to MIT, like... Gabriel mentioned I was the director one of the years and just love to see what's going on with this conference. Loki, one of the best events ever, unbiased opinion, of course. Um, and yeah, let's get started. Plus, um, I think Gabriel did a great job of giving, <laughs> giving us a little bit about your intro, but we'd love to hear just your journey into crypto, what you know excited you and how you got started. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um in 2015, I was working at Medium. It was like my first job out of school. Um, and I was really like a full stack engineer there, but I was finding myself drawn to distributed systems, databases, kind of like falling down into that end of the stack. And um, I learned about Bitcoin. And I honestly, at first, I mean, I think like a lot of people who are in crypto today was just like not that interested in it because to me at the time, like the monetary piece wasn't that interesting. I've since come around on that. But at the time, you know, I was really coming in with this like engineer's perspective. And so when I realized, you know, when some of my friends and some of the people I talked to started explaining to me like, oh, this is this really uh, novel kind of distributed system. Um, you really have this distributed database that has all of these interesting properties that we haven't really seen before. That became very interesting to me. Um, but I do say, I, I sort of sometimes, um, sometimes I sort of say that I got into crypto a little bit backwards too, because I was like, oh, this would be an interesting thing to work on. And so I got a job at a uh, crypto company. It, at the time, it was a Bitcoin API company, actually, which was called uh, Chain, because back in 2015, you could still you know, get that domain name and things like that. Um, and uh, anyway, you know, but I, I do say sometimes that I did it a little bit backwards because I think so many people who um, became interested in this stuff, they were like really passionate hobbyists for a long time. And I, you know, sort of slid into it professionally. And then uh, I think my interest expanded and, and cultivated and grew over time. Um, so that first company chain was like a really great team of engineers who never found product market fit. Um, and so we got to work on like a lot of really interesting things because we pivoted a lot. Um, so we were like a Bitcoin API and then... Um, Isn't that all of crypto? I think that happens to a lot of crypto. I mean, it happens to a lot of tech teams. It happens to a lot of like engineering driven companies. So, you know, it's like a, a beautiful thing and a sad thing at the same time, I think. Um, the beautiful part was that I really did get to work on like a wide range of things ranging from like, you know, our own protocols to... Um, uh, enterprise blockchains to even like a cloud blockchain offering for a time. Uh, so I got to touch lots of different ideas in crypto. Um, and that was also like the peak, like blockchain, not Bitcoin era. Uh, the, the peak, like, you know, Wall Street finance uh, sort of era of this stuff, um, which is really interesting to see as well. 
Um, I then ended up going and um, that team got uh, acquired. We joined forces with some folks from the Stellar ecosystem. And so we worked in this, um, uh, you know, sort of like the for-profit arm of the Stellar ecosystem, which is called Interstellar. Um, and so that was 2019. And, you know, I think probably a bunch of folks here were involved in crypto at that time. And as you may recall, it was like not a super fun time in crypto, actually. Like it was not, people were not very optimistic <laughs> about this stuff. And I remained really optimistic about the technology. But when I looked around and I saw how much people, even like people who worked in crypto and like really, really knew how this stuff worked and, and, and got it, how much they were struggling to even do like simple things like, you know, secure their coins on both sides of a for upcoming fork. And like, I was just like, there is no way. <laughs> that, Going mainstream. Yeah, I was just like, well, well I, I felt like it was coming, but I didn't know on what time frame. And so that was what actually led me to Cosmos, which is where I was most recently. Um, and there I was working with the teams that were building a lot of the really low level protocol stuff. And you know, my thinking there was like, again, I don't really know where this is going and on what time frame, but I think it's really important that we have tools, like low level tools for great interoperability, um, you know, great consensus, having all these options available so that when you know, things start to, to turn around and mature a little bit for consumers, we'll be ready. Um, and I think that maturation point actually came a lot faster than I expected because after I'd been there for about two years, um, you know, and so this is now like the middle of last year, I started looking around and seeing just like a much broader set of people becoming really interested in crypto, seeing people use DAOs, um, which, you know, sort of previously I had only thought of in terms of like the 2016, like the DAO fiasco, right? But, but suddenly like DAOs had like a whole new lease on life. People were using them for all kinds of interesting things. Um, obviously like the NFT boom and seeing again, a much broader, more diverse set of artists and creators use NFTs to monetize, super interesting. Um, so then I was like, okay, like maybe, like maybe this yeah. stuff is starting to come together for like real people, you know, not just like crypto nerds. Um, and that was when Twitter reached out. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, like Twitter is like the web two home of web three. Like this is where the community comes together. I'd also just been a Twitter user for a long time. Um, and, yeah. user. and so that is how that is how I ended up first in in crypto and then at Twitter. Yeah, and I'm assuming it's not very different than working at Cosmos. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is incredibly different. Um, yeah, in so tell many us ways. more about just how different it is. What are your learnings that you're taking from Cosmos? And just curious what the vibe is at Twitter um, around crypto. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know. Totally different job, totally different like ends of the stack. Um, and I would say like very different users, right? And so one of the things that I have been learning in my new role is like how, I keep saying like real people, but like really like how real people who aren't necessarily super um, deep or comfortable or you know have that deep understanding. This actually kind of goes back to what Elizabeth was just saying about like building the right abstractions so that people can use the technology without necessarily understanding all of the nuances. I think that's, you know, that's just where we're at right now is like figuring out what those abstractions really are and what they look like. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would say the vibe, the vibe at Twitter when it comes to crypto is incredibly curious and very interested. So when I came in, like, you know, I was like, I'm going to build a new crypto team or whatever. There were like tons of people already there, already thinking about crypto, already working on stuff. Um, and it has been such a treat, honestly, to come in and just like join forces with this incredible group of folks, um, many of whom are so passionate. Um, you know, the, the NFT profile picture feature that launched er earlier this year, people have been working on that since before I joined the team. Um, and actually, a lot of the folks who had been working on it were just working on it like in addition to what they were you know, already doing otherwise. Project. Like people were just so excited about the space. Um, so it's been, yeah, it's been a real treat to, to come in and see all of that. Yeah, so what was the motivation within Twitter to create a separate team if people internally were already working in some capacity, were excited about it? Uh, what are the goals of this new crypto team at Twitter? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, I, I think just to take a, st a little bit of a step back, 
Twitter's role, we, we view our role as serving the public conversation. And so I think if you look at this at a very high level, it's like, well, there's this new technology, which is like this new open economic layer that can be used you know, in all kinds of ways. Um, and, and Twitter itself is almost like a little economy of like conversation. And, and figuring out how to unite those two things is, is really powerful. Um, what people had been able to do, um, you know, as sort of these like these really passionate engineers and, and product people who I mentioned, um, you know, a lot of people I think were carving out space to like make some small bets. But we also want to think about and start experimenting with things that might start to look like bigger bets. Now we're doing it like rather incrementally, I would say. We're sort of trying some things out here and there. There will be more things that look, you know, sort of more like the NFT profile picture um, piece. But uh, we're just really excited about, you know, all of the possibilities. And in particular, the, the areas that we're looking at and exploring deeply right now are first in creator monetization, which I, I mentioned is something that I sort of started to see and, and thought was really interesting. Um, and so one of the features that uh, launched there, and we take, I would also say, like a very broad view of the concept of like a creator. Like a creator on Twitter, right, is not really like a creator on YouTube where they're creating like parcelable units of content. Like a, like a creator on Twitter is someone who is curating conversation and curating community. And I actually think that's a really natural fit for crypto as well. Um, but anyway, one of the first uh, offerings for creators was this uh, Bitcoin tipping feature where people can tip um, using Bitcoin Lightning. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's just one of the payment options along with uh, some of the fiat options there too. Um, another area that we are diving into and exploring is just trying to find more ways to support the crypto community that exists on Twitter, right? Like we were talking about um, the fact that everyone in crypto finds each other, connects there, and there's, I think, lots of things we could be doing to support that as like a core user group. Um, How more big concretely. is that community? Curious. I actually don't know, um, but it is, you know, it, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a sizable, it's a, it's a sizable force, <laughs> and also like I would say, even for people, you know, at Twitter who aren't necessarily thinking about crypto all the time, they do view the crypto community as a group of people who are really curious and open to trying new things. So a lot of the features that Twitter's released over the last you know, year, year and a half, actually like the crypto community has really embraced those too. So even the, the product teams and engineering teams at Twitter that aren't necessarily like, like the crypto team, they're also thinking about the crypto community. So that's been another thing that's been really cool to see. Um, yeah, and then the sort of final area that we're starting to look at more closely is um, the identity space, right? And we, you know, we see Twitter as something that people use in Web2 as a bit of an identity provider to kind of like attest who they are, right? You see people tweet things with like a hash that's like, I'm verifying myself, I'm, you know. And you, you see this in Web2. And so, you know, for us, I think we start to think about a, like, what does someone really need for a Web3 identity? And two, that's right, one and two. Two, <laughs> um, you know, what does it look like for us to really lean in to the role that we already have as this like Web2 identity provider and start to enable that for people? So that's, um, I would say at a high level, those are the areas that we're looking at and exploring right now. Yeah, that's super exciting. And I want to dig into all three of those. But before that, um, so far, Twitter has launched two crypto products. Mm -hmm. One of them you mentioned is the tipping product. Um, you can now tip people on Twitter using Bitcoin, Lightning, Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And then the second product is the NFT verification. That's right. Product. I would love to hear both just the general motivation behind launching these two specific products as the first crypto products at mm -hmm. Twitter. And also just the outcomes. What happened after you launched? Did you see adoption? Did you see user behavior that was different than expected? Yeah, totally. So um, with Bitcoin tipping, you know, I think it's a little bit more self-explanatory. But the one thing I just do want to call out really explicitly is that Twitter is a very much a global product. Um, we want to support people in you know all kinds of markets, emerging markets across the world. Um, and so being able to roll out with cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin and especially Bitcoin Lightning, um, has just been you know, amazing for that, to be able to have 
global payments basically automatically, regardless of, of where people are. Um, that was a huge motivation, and just especially in terms of bringing like real utility to people because um, this is like a little bit of a tangent, but uh, one of the principles of what I'm doing is, is like, I really don't want to be in this position where I'm just like sprinkling a little blockchain on it to like, you know, make things spicy. Like I'm not, I'm trying to bring technology to people because it will fulfill a real need and solve a real problem. And so in the case of Bitcoin tipping, that's, that's really clear. Um, in terms of the NFT profile picture feature and, and having that verified, um, you know, we started to see on the platform that people were using NFTs as their profile picture. And um, sometimes people were using other people's NFTs for their profile picture and people were calling each other out and there was this whole, you know, this whole thing. And we were starting to see also people use these NFTs to like build persistent personas that they kind of like carried with them through Web 2 and Web 3. And so all of this was just like really, really interesting to us. Um, and one other thing I'll say about Twitter is that it has this history of looking for what people call um, help wanted signs. So Twitter tries to look at user behavior and see what people are already doing, almost like the hacks sometimes that people are weaving into the way that they use the platform, and then like support those things for real. So like the retweet started that way, hashtags started that way, um, where people were just like, you know, initially it was like people would type like RT and then like the other person's tweet. Um, and now, of course, that's like a very real and very important part of the platform. Um, so that's just you know part of the the way that Twitter works. And so we really viewed that as another help wanted sign. Um, in terms of surprising behavior, um, I think I mentioned earlier that sort of switching into this more like consumer oriented role and building things for a different audience has been a learning experience. And I'll say one of the biggest learning experiences for me has actually come from watching some of the challenges that people have had with the NFT profile picture feature. Um, so the, the most common support request we've gotten, well, I don't actually have numbers on that, but I, I think our most common support request um, has been, uh, you know, I connected my wallet and my NFT isn't there. And there basically are two reasons for this, um, two possible reasons. The first is that they connected their wallet, but their NFT is on another blockchain. And, you know, I think we don't do a very good job in the way that we talk about NFTs. We don't, um, you know, people don't talk about like Ethereum NFTs versus Solana NFTs versus Polygon NFTs. They just talk about NFTs. So this is really confusing to people. Um, and it kind of goes back again to this question of like, what abstractions should you be building? Like, do people need to know what network they're operating on? I don't know. I think this is kind of an open question for our industry right now. The other reason why people might not, you know, be able to find their NFT was that, um, you know, a lot of uh, NFT marketplaces um, have a feature where you can like mint your NFT without actually putting it on chain. Um, and so sometimes this is called lazy minting. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, especially creators, especially like people who are new to crypto, would go to the exchange and they would lazy mint an NFT because that's what, what happens by default. Um, and so what this really means is that the NFTs is created, you know, the tokens there, the contracts there, it has all the right signatures and, and all of that, but it doesn't actually go on chain because that's what costs gas. So people are able to mint NFTs for free, but they don't actually go on chain. And again, that distinction like, this is a totally reasonable product decision for any marketplace, right? You want to, to solve this problem of high gas fees for your users. But I think it's a leaky abstraction, right? Because you, you end up leaking this implementation detail of, like, like, memory allocation to your users. And, like, they shouldn't have to think about that. Um, so, anyway, I, I mentioned both of these things because I think they are questions for the industry right now. One is, like... Again, what abstractions are we, are we sharing with people? How much do people want to or need to understand about the underlying technology and like where transactions are persisted and like you know, what gas fees really mean? I don't know. Um, it was also a little bit of a wake-up call for me as someone who is like a big believer in the multi-chain future, 
Cosmos is a project that's very focused on interoperability. I just spent a couple of years really, you know, thinking and thinking about and, and driving towards that vision. And seeing the level of confusion that people had about like what different blockchains meant has been eye-opening. Um, it's also made me start thinking a lot more about what the state of the art looks like today in multi-chain user experiences, which is to like go to a drop down and switch networks, right? And Honestly, I don't think that's gonna cut it long term. Like we're going to have to find a better way to communicate to people, like like to, to reveal that functionality to people without making them think about like switching networks. Like if someone's like if I'm using Visa and you're using MasterCard, like we don't think about those things, right? Um, and I think, you know, especially as we we look at layer twos for scaling, whether that's for Bitcoin or Ethereum or you know, whatever network you're looking at that multi-chain question is going to become, I think, even more important because by and large, the layer twos, even though they share the same security guarantees as the underlying chain, these layer twos have um, a user experience that's more like a multi-chain user experience than, um, than a single blockchain. Yeah, so it sounds like you know the core focus at Twitter is to identify real use cases, what benefits not just the crypto users, which is a component of Twitter user base, mm -hmm. but there is a huge non-crypto user base. Mm -hmm. And then it's not about just building these products, but there's a huge education gap. Absolutely. Where you're launching these products and realizing that people don't necessarily know how to use them or facing certain challenges, especially because it's not just crypto native people. Now it's a lot more, it's a larger user base that you're focusing on. Mm -hmm. um, how do you bridge that gap? How do you see Twitter's role within the Web3 ecosystem, especially coming in from like the Web2 world, which is sometimes not welcomed in the Web3 space? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important for us to build for everyone. Um, and, you know, we might, to be clear, like we might try some features out with like, you know, our power users or power crypto users early and maybe not get everything totally right. But we, we really do think about building for the, the broader audience um, in general. And, you know, when the NFT profile picture feature was released, for example, um, we spent a lot of time uh, on the, like, the the help desk, the um, or not the help desk, but the, um, uh, like, the support center, FAQ, like, here's what an NFT is, here, here's how it works. And, and, you know, we sat down and tried to, like, think of all the things that could go wrong. And some of them we didn't see, right? Like the two problems that I just mentioned, those are like surprising to everyone who worked on, on the feature. Um, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it is a mix of like trying to do education and do that piece and then also trying to think really critically about like the products themselves and the user interfaces you're shipping and like what you can build into your features and, and products that kind of nudge people in the right direction. So like actually in the, the case of this lazy minting thing that I described, this, this problem, um, one of the th things that we're thinking about doing is actually like using APIs from those exchanges directly to say like, hey, do you have this, like what other NFTs do you have in your database that aren't on chain so that we can show those to people and actually maybe like gray them out and say like, hey, just so you know, <laughs> you have this, but it's only, you know, it's not actually on chain yet. So, you know, again, thinking about a mix of like both writing the help center docs, but like no one reads help center docs. So you really have to put it into the product. Um, yeah, and I'm curious, you know, what are the most requested features or products that you're seeing right now? And within Twitter, how are you evaluating? Like there's so many things that Twitter can be doing in terms of integrating crypto, uh, building products that crypto users can use. How are you going about evaluating the entire space? Yeah, so in, just in terms of how we think about what we should be building, um, one of the things that we do at Twitter that you know I feel like we get to do at Twitter is do a ton of user research. Um, and you know, having come from like pretty small crypto companies, pretty small crypto teams that didn't really have like user research orgs, that has been a real treat for me to work with these these researchers. Um, and so they do things like put together focus groups and sort of look at all of the different attitudes, what people are excited about, what they find confusing. Um, and so, you know, at the moment when we're evaluating what ideas to explore, projects to launch, um, we go back to uh, really that utility for users and, and where people are at. 
I will caveat this a little bit by saying that I think we're in this weird place with crypto where things are changing very, very quickly and people don't always necessarily know what they want or what problems they're going to have. So, you know, my job is to look at crypto and Twitter and try to think about what we should be doing like three to five years in the future. And I can't do that by just like asking people what they want. That said, in terms of like the stuff we're, we're you know, planning on shipping uh, like this year, I think we really can lean on that, that user um, uh, research uh, expertise and, and talking to users and, and hearing what they want. Can you share a little bit about what's coming or it's under wraps? I, I can't make any product <laughs> announcements, but um, it's like the one thing I was told I can't, I can't talk about. Um, so I can't make any product announcements, but uh, we are exploring those areas. Um, oh, actually, just to go back to one of the questions you asked earlier or kind of included in the last question, which is about most requested features. Yeah. Um, the most requested feature right now actually is more multi-chain support. So more support for more chains tipping, more support for more chains NFTs. Um, the way that we are thinking about this right now is that we really want to try to get everything right with like a pretty limited set of technologies before we expand and really try to find that product market fit. Um, you know, in part, again, because we've seen the challenges people have in this multi-chain world, and we sort of don't want to just like throw more stuff at people until we feel like we have the right answers. Um, so there's a little bit of hesitancy there. You know, this is not an easy, was not an easy call for me to make because, again, I come from this very multi-chain world and I really do believe in that future. Um, you know, and the other thing I'll say is that a lot of these alternative chains, like they're, one of their biggest features is lower gas fees. And when we think about financial inclusion, when we think about supporting more creators and supporting a broader and more diverse set of creators, that actually really does matter. So it's definitely, you know, trade-offs, but we... We view um, this feature as still very early. It's actually still technically an early access through Twitter Blue Labs, which is like a feature that you know gives people early access to things we're exploring. Um, so we, view, we we do view this as really early, but um, but uh, yeah, the most commonly requested thing is more chains, and we're not like quite ready to do that just yet. Yeah, and each chains have their own trade-offs. Low fees come with. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Other things that we, we might not want to talk about 100%. Um, today. I do want to switch gears and talk a little bit about Blue Sky. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's an independent organization, mm -hmm. but it was started by Jack Darcy. Um, if you're not familiar with Blue Sky, um, if Twitter's mission is to enable public conversations, I think Blue Sky's mission is to enable open and decentralized public conversations in which users have a lot of control in their experience, developers can build applications. So I'm very curious, you know, how Twitter is working with this independent organization, which actually started by, you know, was started by Jack Darcy. Yeah, totally. So um, I'm really glad you asked, because I think this is also confusing to a lot of people. Like people often ask me like, what's happening with the blue sky? And I'm like, you should go ask them. Um, but no, I mean, I'm, I, I, get, I get it, it makes sense. Um, yeah, so like you said, they are independent. Um, they are really thinking about what it means to build a decentralized social media protocol that is sort of built on this federated model um, and, again, decentralizes and distributes, like, the content of social media. Um, it's not clear yet what Twitter's long-term involvement... I mean, Twitter has been a has helped fund Blue Sky, um, but I know Blue Sky is looking for more partners to, to collaborate as well, um, and it's definitely not meant to be, like, a like a one-to-one, -one, like a like a monogamous pairing, I guess. Um, but uh, again, they're really thinking about like the the um, the content itself. What we're thinking about at Twitter Crypto is like, okay, so regardless of whether your social media content is centralized or decentralized, and you know, I think it could go, could go either way long term at Twitter. Um, Regardless of that, there is this open economic layer, this like internet of money that now exists. And that is just incredibly powerful for our users, for people who are trying to create content and get paid for it, for people who are trying to tr transact with each other around the world. Um, and Twitter is like this connective tissue for all these communities and all these people. And we wanna give people access to that too. So again, it's sort of like this separation of concerns in that way. Um, 
we're on very good terms <laughs> with the Blue Sky team. Uh, I've known Jay Graber, the Blue Sky lead, for a long time. Um, I met her back in, I think, like 2016, when you know there weren't, honestly, like a lot of women in crypto. So I we, we connected on that level first. But she's amazing. She's sure. awesome. And I'm, I think I met her at um, MIT Bitcoin Expo, ah. 2018, 2019. Nice. Yeah. So she's an OG. Um, so yeah, we talked to them pretty frequently, and we talk about ways we can collaborate. Um, but uh, um, it's, it's still a bit TBD in terms of like the long-term collaboration partnership. Too, too early to say, I would say. Yeah, so curious what your view um, of decentralized social media is, especially working at a so centralized social media giant, um, especially since um, in the crypto space, maybe this is my bubble, I see that there's a trend now, a lot more people are thinking and talking about decentralized social media. Yeah, for sure, it's it's definitely a big, a big subject right now. Um, I think that there are real challenges to decentralizing user-generated content. Um, there are real trust and safety challenges. Um, it's like really hard to delete anything that goes onto a blockchain. Um, Blue Sky, I think, is taking a really interesting approach where they are not building a blockchain. They're using a lot of like the same ideas and like cryptographic primitives that come from, you know, or I shouldn't say come from, but are used in, in, in blockchains and cryptocurrency. Um, but they pretty explicitly are not using a blockchain because they want to be able to um, provide some more of those like trust and safety type uh, opportunities to, to people. So I think that's really smart, and I think that's something that where they have a leg up on some of the other decentralized social media protocols that, that have become a little bit more trendy these days. Yeah, and I'm excited to see what they do. They're pretty young. They just open source their initial experiment, so super excited. To yeah, see. and I think sometimes people are like, oh, like Blue Sky's been around for a while. Jack announced Blue Sky back in, I think, 2019 or beginning of 2020, but um, the team only really came together like a couple months ago. So they're actually moving really, really fast, um, and I'm excited to see what they, what they come up with next. Yeah, I guess, you know, I have to ask this question um, by popular demand, when edit button? When edit button? Um, it is, we are working on it. Um, hey. Yeah, 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 we were working on it. Um, it was actually, it was announced a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's been on, it's been in the works for a while, um, and sort of actually to like go back to like the challenges around immutability and keeping people safe. Um, I think it's been something that has been in the works for a while, and people are trying to be really thoughtful about because you know Twitter can be this vector for like all kinds of information, and when you have like the retweet function and people can change their content, it's actually like a bit of a challenging product. Um, product thing to pull off. So I know there, there is a team uh, at Twitter that's been working on this. I, I have no idea when it's uh, shipping. Oh, amazing. I didn't realize. Oh, uh, yeah, no. I think it's a, a lot of people it's a real are thing. excited. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> um, I guess just the final question, if anyone in the audience, this is the right place, uh, is interested in working at Twitter, um, what would you say? Yeah, um, hit me up. I am uh, at underscore Tessar on Twitter. I do have an underscore in my username. No, I could not get the username I wanted when I went to work at Twitter. Um, but, but yeah, hit me up on Twitter or, you know, I'll be, I'll be hanging around here for a little while. So come find me. Thank you so much, Des. This was amazing. Thank you. Love chatting with you.